Good afternoon, and welcome to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and uh, today is Thursday, September 8, 2005. The program is live from 2 to 3 in the afternoon, Pacific Daylight Time. It is live, as I uh, think I mentioned, and that means it is in progress if you're listening at the time that I just mentioned. And uh, if it's in progress, it is uh, malleable. It can be shaped almost any shape people want it to go by asking questions over the phone. We'll give you a toll-free number. And if you have a question about the Bible, about Christianity, you can call and ask that question, and you will, by doing so, determine the topic that we'll be talking about at least for a little while today. And uh, if you uh, don't have a question, but you have some opinions that differ from those of the host and feel that it would be good to express and defend those opinions, I welcome you to do that here also. Be glad to have you. On the program, in any case, the number is 1-800-438-5090. It's 1-800-438-5090. Our first caller today is Rashad, who's calling us from Elmont, New York State. Um, Rashad, welcome to the program, and thanks for calling. Um, thank you. Um, how are you doing today, Steve? All right. Alrighty. Uh, well, my, this is my question. It's kind of twofold. Um, <clears throat> the first part of the question is, what do you see? I was, you know, basically I've been listening to your, um, to your theory, your teachings on, um, on dating and marriage and all that stuff. Okay, on the uh, Radically Christian Counterculture series? Yes, on, yeah. on that. And I don't, um, <laughs> I might have, I might have missed it, missed what you said. I have my own I have my own opinion obviously on it, but I, I might have missed it. What what did you what did you say on on flirting? Because in, in my view, I think flirting like the the of the other person. Because ba- basically, you're you're given an idea that there's an interest there when there isn't. Right. Now, I don't know if I. It's been a while since I heard those lectures or gave them. I don't remember if I even mentioned flirting. Did I? I, I don't I don't remember. Okay. Yeah. Well, my position is that God made human beings so that ideally, now, of course, there's been a fall, and therefore the ideal is often not easy to approximate, but ideally, uh, our hearts are made to be in one romantic relationship in a lifetime. Now, I say that's ideal because obviously people die now, and leaving, you know, a a person who's been widowed might get a second or who knows how many husbands or wives if they were widowed often enough, and also uh, divorce in some cases, frees a person to remarry. Now, both both uh, death and divorce are results of the fall, and therefore God has made some confession, apparently, uh, over that which is ideal. But if there had been no fall, the way that the human heart was made by God, I believe, was to be uh, in love with one person of the opposite sex for a lifetime. Now, it doesn't mean it's a sin to have more than one relationship, but it means that it's less than ideal, and uh, there are complications if, you, if you're divorced or you're married or whatever. Now, part of that uh, impacts the subject of dating, and as you asked about flirting, um, a person who is flirtatious, uh, let's, say, let's say a woman, although it could be a man as well, let's say a woman who is flirtatious with every man that she finds attractive is uh, ab- kind of advertising herself as a as available. Now, maybe she is available. If she is truly available to the person she's flirting with, I suppose uh, she can't be entirely faulted for letting her availability be known. Uh, It may not be the most, oh, what should I say, it may not be the most modest way to to match with somebody, but but when someone flirts with many people, I think that their, I, I think their focus is not the same as God's. I think a person should be looking for one person to spend their life with one person that's compatible and and that uh, and that uh, they could build a family with, rather than uh, trying to string out the hearts of a number of people. And when a person is flirtatious in general, I think that that um, that arouses the hearts and sometimes other other aspects of a person's personality of more people than you really plan to be available to. Uh, flirt, flirting often is simply advertising a commodity that you're not really willing to deliver on. Uh, because obviously, if a woman's flirting with, say, three or four or five or ten different guys in the same month, 
uh, she's not really available to all those guys. And uh, it may, she may feel like she's just like a person fishing and dropping a, a hook, you know, in, in the water. And there may be dozens of fish that are interested in the hook, but only one's going to get it. And uh, so she may feel like she's not being promiscuous in it. But I, I think that most of us need to be more aware than we are of how our interaction with people of the opposite sex may be, um, may be arousing something in them, an interest in them, which, uh, we, which we probably shouldn't be arousing because we're not really very seriously interested in them ourselves. I think that, I think that anything romantic between two people, and this is what I define dating as, I, I consider dating to be a romantic um, outing between two people, uh, anything romantic should be restricted to people who really have reason to believe that they that they know each other well enough to really settle down together for life. That doesn't mean they've got a commitment to do that yet, but it means that they're not just being lighthearted in you know engaging the hearts of a multitude of people when they can really only settle in with one. I, I think it's as I said, it's, it's flirting or being flirtatious is a is a false advertising kind of a thing. Now. Frankly, uh, courtship, even legitimate courtship, may have some of the features of flirting between two people who, who really do want to get married. I mean, but that's not what we usually refer to as flirting. Flirting usually has to do with sort of a promiscuous, uh, I, don't, I don't mean sexually promiscuous, but emotionally yeah. promiscuous uh, uh, in, engagement of another person's interest. And, you know, people who do that, I, a lot of times the way we dress, the way we walk, the way we look, with our eyes, the faces we make, the comments we make, are calculated to be flirtatious, even when we wouldn't necessarily have sat down and analyzed ourselves to have been flirtatious. I think that there's something in, in the ego of a man and a woman that likes to think that a lot of people find them attractive. And flirtatious behavior is one way of uh, expressing that egotism. It's, it's not generally the way that virtuous people find a mate. Necessarily, I mean, I'm not saying that virtuous people never find mate by one person flirting with the other, but uh, I'm saying that you know, looking for a mate isn't about conquest. It's not about uh, ego. It's about finding somebody who seemingly is God's match for you. And flirting is not the most uh, reliable way to find that person or to discover whether a person is that person or not, in my opinion. Okay, so and the second the second part of the question, which is which is not really related but kind of, is what do you, what do you think of, of um, the way eHarmony does things? Well, I've I've never I've never been on eHarmony, but I've heard their advertisements. It sounds like they have what twenty something categories of compatibility that they they that, that people test for. To, and, and now I I don't know how this goes, you know. Um, I just heard an ad for them just before my program came on today, and you know they say a lot of people have become you know linked and married through their service, and I believe that's probably true. It seems to me, from from what I understand about a service like eHarmony, so that that it it sounds like it could be a very responsible and godly way to find a mate. Um, it it certainly is more likely that you'll find a compatible mate with their procedure, I would think, than simply going to some. Um, you know, dating website or something and looking at the pictures of people you like and, you know, hoping to convince yourself that you're compatible with someone who looks good to you. Uh, not that Christians shouldn't seek a mate that's attractive to them. I certainly would want to be married to someone who's attractive to me, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But uh, when physical attraction is the first consideration, uh, it often eclipses many other important considerations that would tell a person if they were being more objective, that uh, that the person they're attracted to isn't really good for them, isn't a good match for them. And I think, uh, again, not being personally familiar with eHarmony's, uh, you know, whatever they give, quiz or whatever it is, uh, it sounds to me like they've got a good system. And I, I would think that it would be uh, quite uh, an acceptable way for Christians to, to meet compatible people. Okay, sounds good. Thanks so much. All right, good to hear from you, Rashad. Are you a single guy? Yeah, I'm a single guy. And are are, are you on eHarmony looking for a, for a mate? No, no, I'm not on eHarmony. I've tried it, but you know, because I'm unemployed at the moment, so you know, I'm not able to to like 
paper so I can, you know, go yeah. further with it. Sure. Well, uh, you know, God knows what you need. And if you need a mate, he can find you one, even if you were in, you know, on a desert island and there were only a few people there. God knows how to find the right person and bring them into your life. Mm-hmm. I, I do God bless have, you. I do have someone in mind, but, you know, I'm, oh, good. You know, I'm still praying on it. All right. Well, it's good to hear from you. I hope, hope my comments uh, help somehow. Okay. Thank you so much, Steve. All right. God bless you, man. God bless you, too. Bye-bye. Let's talk to uh, Devin next, who's calling from Redmond, Washington. Devin, welcome to the program. Hi, Steve. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, last week, you were talking about uh, whether or not Hurricane Katrina was a judgment from God. But I was asked that. Yeah, right. Yeah, and your conclusion was, um, I, I believe it was, I, it's been a while since I heard that program. Uh, it was something like, it, it possibly was, it most likely was, but that's what you like to think of it as. Or Actually, can you... I'll repeat your response to that, actually. Yeah. I, I didn't say it's what I like to think of it as, because that sounds like I would take some delight yeah, in the concept. Yeah, I'm sorry. That way yeah, I, uh, what, what I was asked was, do, uh, it was usually, I was asked this about three times last week by different callers, uh, is it possible that uh, what happened in, in the southern states through Hurricane Katrina is a judgment on America because of our uh, urging Israel to give up some of her land? And uh, it coincided uh, chronologically very closely to Israel giving up Gaza and so forth. And I said that our nation probably is ripe for judgment, uh, although I don't think that uh, what happened over in Israel has very much to do with our being ripe for judgment. I think that we're ripe for judgment on a a number of other things much closer to home. Uh, And uh, I, I do believe that our nation is not only ripe for judgment, but might in fact be under judgment. Uh, I don't know. And I said that I can't say whether Hurricane Katrina was a judgment from God, but I said my private opinion is that it probably is. But I, but my private opinion is just that. It's, it's my own opinion. It's, it's not, I don't take an official position as if I know. Uh, I, I can't read God's mind about it. So my problem with that is that um, Amos 3 says the Lord does nothing without revealing it to the prophets. And I haven't heard anything um well, from prophet or from God himself, but um, then again, I guess it doesn't uh, mean that God hasn't spoken to anybody about this or people in that area, but, uh, um, and and even if uh, he did, with your view of the sovereignty of God, uh, you, I understand that you believe everything in the universe is under active control of God, and he's actively controlling it, and, uh, I mean, if that's true, then everything in the past, all, all, all little, every single little disaster that's ever occurred would have been a judgment from God, according to that. And then how do you reconcile that with Amos 3? Okay, well, first of all, I don't think I've ever said that I believe everything in the universe is uh, controlled by God, or I should say ordained by God. Uh, I do think everything is under God's control in the sense that he could stop something from happening if he wanted to. I mean, it's obvious that he could stop a, a, a train. He could he could stop the world from turning if he wanted to. There's there's really nothing that God can't control. And in that sense, God is in control of everything. But uh, by in control, what I mean is he has all the uh, prerogatives. If he wishes to intervene, he can. It is my opinion, however, that God does not intervene all of the time, that God made a, a universe that, that is run by laws. Now, this, this is a very non-Calvinist position I'm taking. Calvinists believe that God you know, controls everything in a very direct and uh, uh, proactive way. You know? But in my opinion, God created uh, laws and motion and, uh, and, and living things and thinking and willing things like human beings and angels. And he allows them, to a very large degree, to take their course. And uh, he will, uh, he'll intervene if there's something that he doesn't want to see happen. Uh, if an army is coming against Israel and he doesn't want them to come against Israel, he can stop them. If a meteor uh, is coming toward the earth and God doesn't want it to the earth, he can, he can deflect it. He can do whatever he wants to. And, and therefore, whatever does happen, we could at least say God didn't, disallow it. God didn't stop it from happening, though he could have. But that doesn't mean that God directly sent it. Um, Many of the things that are disasters that humans experience are the result of, well, apparently natural laws. But God can also work through those if he wishes. 
uh, a hurricane may be a, a judgment from God, or it may simply have to do with the natural factors that cause a hurricane, that, and God doesn't choose to stop it. But God can manipulate natural factors if he wants to. So I'm, I'm not saying that every disaster was something that God specifically ordained to happen, although certainly every disaster is something that God decided not to prevent, though it may have been caused by something entirely different. Now, as far as uh, the sovereignty of God is concerned, you see, I, I don't believe that God being sovereign requires that he dictates everything that happens. Just like a king being sovereign doesn't mean he dictates everything that happens in his domain. It just means that he has the right to do whatever he wants to do, and God certainly has that. Uh, so, I'm, you know, I, my position is that I, I don't know that God sent Hurricane Katrina, uh, and I don't know that he didn't. He could if he wants to. And he could have stopped it if he wanted to. Or it may simply be that he allowed natural events to take their course. Now, it's interesting that we are experiencing far more disasters of this type in the last few years than I think we'd had, at least more severe ones, than we'd had for a very long time before. Um, somebody told, in fact, more than one person told me that the weekend before Katrina hit uh, New Orleans, there was scheduled to be some kind of a... Uh, I don't know, gay pride demonstration of some kind in the city. I don't know exactly what all would be involved, but it, had, but it was supposed to be a very decadent affair. Some people, of course, immediately see, well, God hit the city to prevent that from happening. Maybe he did. I, I'm not here to speak for God's secret purposes. Uh, you know, I'm here to talk about what the Bible says, because those are the things that God has revealed to us. It says in Deuteronomy 29:29 that the secret things belong to the Lord, but those which he's revealed are for us and our children. Now, you said in Amos chapter 3, God said, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. That's true, but it's also kind of a hyperbole. When it says God will do nothing, uh, I mean, every little thing God does doesn't have to be announced by a prophet, but a large thing, like judgment of a nation, very, uh, especially a nation that has a lot of Christians in it, would probably be something God would give some inkling about. But I, I'm not sure God hasn't. Uh, I've heard people who are godly people, perhaps even prophetic people, saying that America is teetering on the brink of judgment. I've heard that for many years now. And uh, so if it hits, I don't really think anyone can say God didn't tell us. I mean, certainly th there are people in the, in the body of Christ who've been predicting some serious judgments on this country for a long time. And if they do happen, yeah. well, you know, then you can't say God didn't warn us. But there's also been a lot of people predicting uh, second coming in the next year or something like that, too, though. I mean, Well, that's true, and that's, that's a problem, isn't it? I mean, uh, we've got people who are false prophets, and we've got people who probably are not false prophets. Um, and discernment is, is what's needed here. Now, if somebody had said there's going to be uh, lightning that will strike, uh, or fire and brimstone is going to come down from heaven and strike New Orleans, and a hurricane came and said, said I'd have to say, well, that person was not a, not a true prophet, even though, coincidentally, New Orleans was destroyed in another way. Uh, I, I don't try to attach too much spiritual meaning to things like this. Uh, like I said, in my own mind, I suspect that what happened down there could be a, a part of a, of a series of judgments on this country that God may be bringing. I could be wrong, and I, I've never gotten on a... Uh, street corner and, and said that this is the case, or, or here on the radio either. I've just said that's my private opinion. And uh, an opinion is just an opinion. The Bible doesn't tell us whether this is a judgment from God or not, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to declare it to be. Um, I just like to, to think God would warn uh, his true followers in that area of, of what's actually about to come. Um, it may or may not happen, but like I said, Amos 3 could have been a hyperbole. And I heard you uh, talk about the your view of the sovereignty of God on a tape series, and I forget exactly which one. You were talking about uh, a stoplight and whether or not God act actually controls the stoplight, you know, when it turns yellow or red. And you were saying, well, people would say, uh, they're on timers, and you gave a rebuttal to that. And I don't know. <laughs> you did that. Well, you, you're probably talking about my series, God's Sovereignty and Man's Salvation. And I don't remember the statement, but I do. Re okay, but I do remember that when I was young, I, I and I, I think I've said this in teaching in some context. I don't remember where, but uh, that when I was young, I thought God's sovereignty extended even to when the traffic signals changed. But that 
uh, that was when I was young, and that in, in my later years, I've come to really suspect that a lot of that is, is simply uh, chance. Oh. Okay. And so, I mean, I, I probably gave that illustration as something that I thought when I was younger, because I remember very specifically uh, expressing that opinion when I was in my teens. And, uh, and yet, in almost all the decades since then, I've, I've had doubts that that is the case. Okay, I'm sorry to misrepresent you then about that. Oh, that's all right. Um, okay, well, thanks for answering my question. All right, Devin, oh, good. Oh. Regarding that, that, the last call was talking about uh, uh, eHarmony.com. Um, I'm a single guy, too. I've looked into it, but the reason why I haven't and done anything like that is because those websites really focused in on compatibility. And, I mean, though compatibility helps and it really contributes to a relationship, I guess. <laughs> but... um they don't really focus on commitment, and I really believe that a marriage is, is all about commitment. Uh, well, you make a good point, uh, and I think there's, I think, it's, I don't think it's either or, but I think that commitment is the primary thing because people who are not very compatible can have a successful marriage if they're truly committed. Um, and I, I mean, I've got proof of that because I was married for 20 years to a woman who shortly after we got married we discovered in many ways in which and important ways that we weren't as compatible as we thought we were but we stayed together because of commitment for 20 years and I would still be with her because of my commitment if she had stayed committed Uh, she had a bit of a a, a mental breakdown in uh, in her her life uh, irrespective of the marriage it had more genetic and uh, hereditary I think I don't know what it is but but anyway, uh, she she simply left. But the point is that for 20 years, though there wasn't much con- in the way of compatibility there, there was uh, enough commitment to God and to each other that we had a reasonably happy marriage. You know, it was not a, it was not a miserable marriage all those years. But uh, people today don't know what commitment is. They they feel that they're supposed to be married to someone who makes them feel good and who makes them happy. And if they find after they got married that the person they're with doesn't then they feel like they should move along and find someone else. And, and the things that make them feel happy as a person often have to do with those matters of compatibility. Um, and, boy, I, I agree with you that even if people are not very compatible, if they find themselves to be married to each other, their commitment can make that relationship successful. However, eHarmony.com is not appealing to people who are already married and who have to keep a commitment that they've already made eHarmony.com is appealing to people who are not yet married. And, and I'll tell you, uh, when my wife uh, left me a few years ago, one of the first things I did was sit down and make for myself a list. I'd never heard of eHarmony.com, but I I'd made myself a list of areas where my wife and I were not really very compatible that became a checklist for me. I thought, well, I would never remarry unless I find someone who's compatible with me in these areas. Now, if if I got married thinking... I was compatible to somebody and found out I wasn't, well, my commitment would keep me married. Mm -hmm. But as a single person, as a single person uh, considering for marriage somebody, uh, there's no reason for me to, uh, you know, hit myself on the head with a hammer by by ignoring areas of incompatibility. I mean, once you're married, you're there. You're there. And if you're incompatible, you deal with it. But why make more problems for yourself than you need to? And and so, I mean, commitment is, is the big thing. That makes a marriage successful, not compatibility. But when you're a single person considering whom you wish to be committed to, uh, considering areas of compatibility is a very wise thing to do, it seems to me. But one of the areas of compatibility is to find someone who believes in commitment. Because yeah. you, because, because you will find, you will find, once you're married, that there are areas of incompatibility between you and anyone that you're married. No two people are exactly alike. And so, the degree to which the person you marry has a history of honoring commitments will be one of the most important things that keeps that marriage going. I mean, if a person is faithful to keeping their word, then they are a good risk in marriage. But if they're not compatible with you in other ways, they may be not a, it may not be a very happy marriage. And I'd say that it's good to have both. I think it's good to have someone who's faithful and also compatible. But, you know, if I, if I were considering somebody for marriage and, and I, I found out they don't pay their bills on time, they left their last husband on, you know, something that wasn't quite, you know, necessary grounds, uh, you know, they're, they're known to be, uh, to break appointments without, without, you know, 
a good reason. They're late all the time. Even though they say they'll be on time, they, they simply are careless about keeping their word. I'd say, here's a person who doesn't know what commitment and faithfulness are. And, uh, you know, even outside of marriage, if they're not keeping their promises day by day to people, uh, they're not a good risk. Because Jesus said, he that is faithful in that which is least will be faithful in that which is great. And he that is unfaithful in that which is least will be unfaithful in that which is great. So marriage commitment is a great commitment. If you find someone who's unfaithful to, in the area of fulfilling their promises to their, to their friends, their children, uh, you know, their, their creditors, and so forth, then they're not likely to be a good risk of being faithful to you, mm-hmm. married to you. Uh, I've written down a similar list of, of things I'd like to look for in a wife, but uh, eventually I realized I was basically writing down myself. <laughs> yeah. But, um, well, do you have another call in one? I do, but uh, but I'll give you some time here. My my lines are not entirely full. Pretty long questions, so I won't answer. Oh, okay. Well, you can call another time, and we'll get yeah. into it. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right, Devin, thanks for your call. Have a good one. Bye. God bless you. Bye bye. All right, you're listening to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. We have some lines open for you. If you'd like to be on the program, you can call us. Any question you have from the Bible, any point of disagreement with the host on any subject you've ever heard discussed on this program today or previously. You can bring that up if you'd like. The number to call is 1-800-438-5090. The program's half over. you got the other half ahead of you. Give me a call, 1-800-438-5090. And Rich from Marina, California, welcome to the program. Hello? Hi. Steve. Yeah, you're on the air. Welcome. Oh, hi, Steve. Steve? You're shocked, shocked to be on the air after being on hold so long, huh? Oh, yeah, I know. What, what, what's going on? <laughs> well, right now I'm not doing much but talking to you and a few thousand other people. Well, that's all right. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on my cell phone, so I'm using up minutes. <laughs> okay, well, let's not use up any more than you need to. Okay. Anyway, no, it's, it's okay. Thank you. Well, I'm paying by the minute to be on the air, too, so why don't we move into whatever you called about? Oh, well, it helps. No, I just wanted to uh, call. Now I, I changed my um, my focus um, after what he just talked about uh, with his um, excuse me um, the marriage thing. Huh. So can I talk? Can I talk to you? We're right here. We're on the air. You can talk to me about anything you want, but you you need to talk because we're on the air. Oh, I'm sorry. My God. Yes. Yes. I wanted to call you about um, Revelation chapter 20. Uh-huh. I'm sorry. I didn't recognize your voice. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, um, and you are a, a millennialist, right? That's right. That's right. And it, could you explain that a little bit to me? Because um, um, Revelation chapter 20... Verse 1 and verse 7 talks about a thousand years. So if you could do that for me, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Well, there's a thousand years mentioned six times in the book of Revelation. They're all, all six times are in one chapter, Revelation 20. And in fact, these are the only references to a thousand years anywhere in the whole Bible. So the whole, the whole doctrine of the thousand years has to do with our interpretation of this one chapter, okay. Revelation 20. Now, the word millennium, the word millennium, as you know, means thousand years. So when people talk about their view of, of the millennium, what they're talking about is uh, their view of Revelation 20. Now, an amillennialist is a person who believes that there's not a literal millennium, not a, not a literal thousand years referred to in this chapter, but that the thousand years is symbolic. Uh, a more familiar these days is the premillennial view which holds that Jesus will return to earth before the millennium. So they believe in a premillennial return of Christ. That's a much more popular view today. <clears throat> and there's also a postmillennial view that holds that Jesus will come back after a thousand years of millennial uh, peace. But the amillennialist believes that the whole chapter about the thousand years is really describing something symbolically. And the symbolism actually refers to the conquest of the powers of darkness, which Christ accomplished at the cross, yep. and the, thousand, the so-called thousand years is symbolic. It represents the period of time 
between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. So we could say it represents the church age. And uh, the binding of Satan is a figure that speaks of how Christ has disabled and, uh, and defeated Satan at the cross. And he's, he's bound, bound through the majority of this church age, and then he's released so that he's apparently able to do more damage than ever. And then Christ comes in verse 9 when fire from heaven comes down and consumes uh, the enemies of God's people. That would be the second coming of Christ. Yep. That's followed by the resurrection and the creation of the new, new heavens and new earth. That's the millennial view. Um, could you, you know, thank you. Uh, could you answer another question? Okay, but my lines are full right now, so oh, I know. go ahead. Hello? Um, oh, yes, uh, I'm sorry. Um, I have one question. Um, I had a, a dealing with um, um, a Catholic person. And they said, you know, because we have to go to confession in, in the booths and stuff. And I thought, no, in Hebrews it says, no, we don't have to do that. Because God, Jesus, is our intermediate, <coughs> excuse me, our intermediate area. That He's our high priest. Yeah. So um, could you just, um, just focus on that one just for a sec? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. The Bible says that there's, uh, Paul, uh, Paul told Timothy, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. There's not anyone that we have to go through, no human being on earth that we have to go through in order to get forgiven for our sins. We can go directly to God. It says in Hebrews that we should come boldly before the throne of grace and receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. That's in Hebrews chapter 4. And, and you're right, the book of Hebrews in general is about that about how Christ is our high priest. Now, uh, one of the things, the Roman Catholic uh, view on this has an underlying premise that, that you may not be aware of and that we probably wouldn't agree with as non-Roman Catholics, and that is this, that only the true church, only in the context of the true apostolic church, can sins be forgiven. And, and therefore, they believe the Catholic church is that apostolic church, and that the priests of the Roman Catholic Church stand as agents of Christ. And Christ said to his apostles in uh, John chapter 20, and verse what, 22, I guess there's 21 and 22, Jesus said, uh, whosoever sins you retain, they are retained, and whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted. And they say, well, that's, that's an apostolic prerogative to forgive sins or not. Hmm. And since the priests of the Roman Catholic Church are authorized by the bishops of the church who are the, the uh, successors of the apostles, the, the authority to forgive sins resides only in the Catholic clergy. So when you, go to a, when you go to the priest to confess your sins so he can say your sins are forgiven, that's kind of the only way to get forgiven as far as they're concerned. I mean, that is, it has to be through the church. It has to be through uh, the mediation of Roman Catholic uh, officials. So that's why they go there. But but I don't believe that the Bible teaches that. I believe that we go directly to God. I don't, I don't believe that either. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, then we're on a, an agreement on that, Rich. Okay. I've, got to, I've got to take some more calls here. Sorry. Sorry. That's all right. Okay, oh, thanks for calling. Uh, just before I hang up, um, yeah? did you have a good time in over in Salinas? I, I'm sorry I didn't get over there. Yeah, we had a great we had a great meeting. We had more people than we expected. I, uh, that, uh, the, li the living room was uh, too small for them all, but it was a good time. We'll be meeting in Salinas again on the 30th of this month, another Friday. It's good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. God, God, God bless you, Rich. Bye-bye now. Uh, speaking of the meeting in Salinas, we are having a meeting in Santa Cruz tomorrow night in a home. Uh, tomorrow night is Friday, September 9th, and it's an open Bible discussion such as we have here on the air. Only it's in a home. We do this on a regular basis, actually. If you live in the Santa Cruz area or near enough to drive in and would like to attend that meeting, you can get directions to that home. It's tomorrow night again at 7 o'clock. You can call this number, 475-8301. Now, if you didn't get that number and you want it, it's at the website. If you go to www thenarrowpath.com, click on uh, the, the link that says Announcements, and you'll find there's a phone number there, the, just the one I just gave you, and it'll, 
you can call that number to get directions to our gathering tomorrow night in Santa Cruz. That's again, 475-8301. Talk next to Jim, who's calling from Salinas, California. Jim, welcome to the program. Good to talk to you again, Steve. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, is, is that at Waybright? It is. So, for folks taking the uh, public transit, the 69 bus to Jose Park is how to get there. That'd be from Salinas, where you live, right? Yeah. Or from from Santa Cruz itself, because it's over there toward uh, Live Oak area. All right. Well, that's yeah. They can they can find out whatever they want about that by calling if they want to come. But uh, I wanted to uh, find out what you are aware of in terms of how much uh, is going on in terms of persecution of Christians in uh, countries. I I know what's happening with Islam, but what's happening in countries that are dominated by uh, Hindus and other similar uh, religions? Well, you know, there's some organizations that do a pretty good job of reporting on those things. I, I don't keep up on it completely. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm generally aware of the ongoing persecution of Christians in India, for example, which is Hindu. Uh, and obviously in Muslim countries, I have friends who are missionaries in Muslim lands. Uh, of course, communist countries have persecuted Christians for a long time. It seems like, uh, there's a lot more places in the world where Christians are persecuted than where they aren't. Uh, although Christianity often grows very well in those places where where it's being persecuted, but no, I don't I don't have much on the as far as the details about the current persecution in Hindu countries. But organizations like uh, Open Doors with Brother Andrew or Voice of the Martyrs, uh, Richard Wormbrand's organization, the late Richard Wormbrand's organization, uh, you know, regularly publish information about those things. I noticed this. Uh and I've got to look at it further, but somebody emailed me uh, hypertext to Voice of the Martyrs uh, website. And uh, it's, a, it's a great organization. It's one of the it's one of the organizations that I support financially. I think they're great. So I'm encouraged to you know, even before I explore further here to recommend there on the subject of the. Catholic Church on the uh, concept that with the priest and the uh, confession. Well, I was thinking more of the garb and the nomenclature. That was the word that I was trying to think of, and I, that was eluding me for a minute there. In terms of their nomenclature, it seems to me, uh, and I, I say this from my own perspective. Uh, the ethnic uh, Jew, uh, that a lot of it is essentially uh, Judaic in origin. And so my question is, in your judgment, is the Roman Catholic Church what is being referred to by Paul when he refers to Judaizers? Mm, I I don't think so, because the Judaizers that Paul refers to were advocating circumcision and Jewish uh, laws. Of course, you're right, the Roman Catholic traditions have incorporated a lot of things that are uh, similar to the Jewish traditions but and laws, but they're not really exactly the same. Uh, they, may in, they may have the same attitude toward them that the Judaizers had. It's just a different... Uh, it's, what it is, it's mixing Christianity with Judaism is what Judaizers did. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church throughout history has mixed Christianity with a combination of Jewish-type things and uh, and also pagan uh, practices and, and, and holidays and so forth. And so, uh, you know, it, it's a little different kind of syncretism than what the Judaizers did, but it's, it's a similar error, it seems to me. Because I was thinking uh, in terms of the Catholics, one, one that, that I hear a lot is that, you know, because I associate a lot with uh, Catholics, of course, myself, uh, that a lot of the things that I say are, quote, you know, out of sync with canon law. And you know, they're, they're very big on what they call canon law. 
And it seems to me that that, that that's almost like the way the scribes and Pharisees were, was, uh, so to speak, how they dotted their I's and crossed their T's, to put it in modern vernacular. Well, sure, yeah. I mean, there's, there are, not only in the Roman Catholic Church, but in many movements today, there are what we'd have to call the equivalent. It's not the, it's not the same thing, but it's the equivalent of the legalism that the Judaizers were guilty of, that Paul addressed in Galatians and other places. So, uh, I mean, yeah, the Roman Catholic Church has its traditions of men, and the Pharisees had the traditions of men also that they followed. And, and of course, there are other movements that have traditions of men, just different ones. Oh, I appreciate your take on that, because as, as I was studying, that, you know, it, it occurred to me as, as I was reading again, Paul on the subject that maybe he had something like the uh, modern day uh, Roman Catholic uh, concept in mind and, and so that's why I asked the question yeah well something like it something like them you know uh, the Roman Catholics are not the only Christian group that has traditions of man that they adhere to but they differ from certain Protestant groups in that the Roman Catholics are not ashamed to adhere to traditions of men, whereas Protestant groups that do so uh, deny that they do so, <laughs> you know? Uh, I mean, basically, a Protestant group will, because it's Protestant, will argue that its views are biblical and that they don't follow human traditions. But, of course, Protestant groups have as many human traditions, well, I don't know about as many, but they have plenty, as does the Roman Catholic Church. But the difference is the Roman Catholic Church is not ashamed to say that they follow human traditions. They actually believe that the traditions of the Church are sacrifice as much as the scripture. You know, I've got another call i got taken running out of time here, Jim. Okay. Well, uh, good talking to you, and the Lord enabling, I'm going to try to get over there to Waybright tomorrow night. Well, it'll be good to see you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. All right. God bless you, man. God bless you, too. Bye-bye. All right. You are listening to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. We're going to talk next to Mike, who's calling from Santa Cruz, California, and we might have time. Who knows if you want to call in the numbers one 800 438 Five zero nine zero. Mike, thanks for waiting. Yeah, hi, Steve. Uh, since the uh, topic of marriage and flirting and e-harmony came up, I just had to call in. Okay. Uh, that's a sort of a favorite topic of mine. Um, I did go the e-harmony route with uh, wonderful success. Um, I'm not um, saying that to recommend it to anybody. The only thing I would ever recommend would be that a man or a woman follow uh, God's leading. They've got to pray and um, ask for God to guide their steps and their hearts and everything. Um, that's what I did. Uh, I found it was um, really a website or a service that's geared uh, more towards marriage than anything else. I would never have considered um, such a thing. Um, uh, people were recommending it to me. I heard their ads. It was interesting, but I just wasn't going to do that. It was weird, I thought. Uh, and I prayed. And it took a number of weeks, and I finally just decided, okay, I'll take a look. And I looked, and, and I thought, well, that's weird. And I and I walked away. And then I, I just kept praying because um, I'd been single for a number of years. And um, uh, after a 25-year rotten marriage and uh, gun shy and leery and everything, and I finally went back. I just I actually felt like that was what God was leading me to do. Um, and I thought, well, that's pretty weird, too, and I guess I'll eventually find out whether that's really God leading me to do that. And uh, But within five days of being on there, I found my wife, um, whom you have met. And, um, yeah. And <laughs> so um, I just want to say that to these guys that are thinking about it. And like I'm saying, I'm, I'm not recommending eHarmony to anybody. Uh, yeah. but, I, but I do believe, I did find that, um, yes, uh, they're geared towards marriage. Um, not people who just want to date around. They make you work hard, and they do um, have a good measure of, of success in matching you up. You don't get to go surfing around uh, through uh, lists of names and pictures. Uh, they they do the work after you do the work. And uh, it's, it's not really what I'd call a Christian site. It's geared towards Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and atheists and everybody else. Uh, but they have a significant... Um, I'd, I'd call it, uh, there, there are basic uh, biblical principles at work, and um, just basic ones, nothing elaborate. 
Uh, but, you know, the whole subject started out with the flirting. Um, people who flirt, if, if, if a guy finds a woman who's flirting, just walk away from her and forget it. Uh, she's someone that usually what's going on is uh, she is testing her power. Women have power over men uh, with their eyes and, and the way they walk and the way they dress and things like that and, and their little words that they say. And if they're into uh, playing with that power, um, that's who they are, that's the way they operate, and that's the way they will be if they are married to you. And so forget it, I'd say. Uh, you, Guys have to grow up and, and think hard. I, I didn't when I was young. I didn't know anything about anything and married badly. Um, we had the one caller that was talking about commitment, and um, I, I think uh, eHarmony has some focus that direction. Um, uh, I can't remember. It's been a year and a half almost now. Um, but, yes, I agree with what you were saying, that um, – the marriage is built on commitment. It's like uh, you heard you hear uh, so often in Christian um, ministry uh, preaching and teaching. Um, marriage is not based on love. It's based it's based on commitment. That you do want to find somebody who is uh, where you're compatible as much as possible. But you are going to find incompatibilities later on, and that will test your commitment. Enough said. Well, that's uh, that, that's a good survey of, of what's out there, and, and I guess your your case gives us a, a good advertisement for that uh, that working for the glory yeah. of God at times. You know, yeah. uh, I think I think Christians might uh, sometimes feel awkward about about looking to some kind of website. Yes, I do. To, to, to find a mate, uh, but you're right, eHarmony.com. Uh, from what I've heard, you know, I mean, the advertisements on the radio, even on secular radio, they advertise. Uh, you know, it sounds to me like they are very much uh, helping you find a mate who is compatible rather than just a, a bunch of people to date. And that's, uh, I, I respect them for that. I, I don't expect ever to go on there, and I never have. But uh, I did. But at, at the same time, you know, uh, you know, when you're single, there's all kinds of jokes that are made about, you know, going to the single fellowship to find a mate. You know, and, uh, you know, eHarmony or, or maybe some other similar thing on the Internet could possibly be just a larger single fellowship where you find a mate. Now, there's, no one should be cynical about the fact that single people want to find a mate. Actually, it's one of the most virtuous things they can do. The people who, who make fun of it, often they're, they're looking to date people, but they're not looking for a mate. So, I mean, uh, if, if a person is single and wants to find a mate, I can't see anything to be said against going to a church singles fellowship or or a website that has, you know, Christian singles that are there for godly reasons, you know. Um, I mean, it beats meeting someone in a bar, and, and you're not going to probably meet someone sitting around at home waiting for them to come to your door. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, so I'm not someone who uh, goes out many places, like church, um, and, and, and never a bar, the one thing about okay. harmony is uh, when I say they, they make it work and it's uh, commitment-oriented or marriage-oriented, uh, people who are dating and just fooling around are not going through – they're not going to go through the amount of work that eHarmony requires. You have to spend several hours uh, thinking hard, working through their uh, surveys and questionnaires, and people that are not serious just aren't going to do it. So they're filled, a lot of those are just filtered out right away. And so anyhow, I, you know – I, I, I think that um, Christian men or, or women should not uh, rule out such a thing. But like I was saying before, uh, the thing to do most of all is, is pray and walk with God. And um, I, I don't believe that there are many people who God intends to be single. And if they have desires um, and attractions and things, then it's most likely that God did not make them to be single. And so if, if they're not made to be single, uh, God does have someone out there for them, I do believe. And so it, that's, that's the main thing, just, just to uh, pray each day uh, to be wise in your ways and, and things that you do. And um, God will use any number of things. I didn't expect him to use the harmony for me. Um, I really just felt led in all seriousness. I gave it time and a lot of thought, and I had a lot of hesitation, and I just went ahead and did it. And I, just for one month, that's all I was going to do. I wasn't going to get hung up on that sort of thing. Um, 
uh, but things just um, came together so beautifully and simply and very well. well this, this sounds like one of those those infomercials for eHarmony.com. Yeah, right. I didn't want to sound that way, but I thought <laughs> it, I might not be able to avoid it. You know, I, I went. I made a list like you were thinking of, like you, like you were describing of, and I think that's My, really really important. A, a list of qualities that you expect to find in somebody and. Um, first and foremost, I wanted a woman who was a highly responsive to scripture. And I found that out by sitting and we would just read together and study together and I saw her responsiveness and, uh, that was the number one criteria and, uh, we went from there. Yeah. Well, I've heard on eHarmony's ads, there's something like, what is it, 27 yeah. categories? Right. But I, when, when I've heard that, I thought, well, they're not as picky as I am because my, my list of categories was probably about Seventy, you know. Along with the there, I think they're, they're yeah. talking about general areas of personality. Yeah, uh, there. That's going to be a different uh, list uh, than yours. Of, well, right. Somewhat, I guess. I don't know. But, yeah, uh, for me, for me, personality is not anywhere near as important as uh, spirituality. Yeah. Yeah. Well, personality and interest. But, but personality matters. It definitely matters. Yeah. But, but they, uh, they, they also they also have a focus on uh, your areas of interest and. You know, likes and dislikes. But, um, yeah. And, and it's uh, very psychologically oriented, which um, made me leery, but because um, uh -huh. that can be very erroneous. But uh, I think they do a good job of it. Yeah. Well, a lot of our calls today have been, I guess, on uh, geared to the single listener out there. Even though we we never plan any particular topic to dominate the program, it, it's just uh, based on who whoever calls out what. But. Uh, I guess uh, perhaps God has had it go this way so that people who are listening who are single could uh, maybe have some hope. Yeah, if I could take just one more minute, this is and this is a topic that really I think would be great to devote a show, a whole last, a whole program to. Uh, okay, I only I only have about one minute. Go ahead. Yeah, um, this is something that especially the men, young men, the single men, uh, really should focus on is understanding what marriage is. That it's a covenant two people make before God. It's an institution of God. We were made man and woman. And uh, where we look in the Bible to understand marriage is a relationship between Christ and the church, the bride of Christ. And uh, So I'm going to leave it right there, and now you see why I say it really could take a whole uh, program. But uh, and guys are going to have to um, uh, search that out for themselves. Uh, you know, with, uh, you know, with the Bibles open and, and with a good mentor. Right. I don't they know if you... Have, they won't have a successful uh, biblical godly marriage without that. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen this at, uh, at my website, but there's a, an article on what is marriage that I, that I wrote some years ago, and it, it goes through scores of scriptures and, and an outline of what marriage is and what the roles of husbands and wives are, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, emphasizing what you've said. Listen, we're out of time, but I appreciate your call, Mike. Okay, Steve. God bless you. All right, that website is www.thenarrowpath.com. And uh, you can hear the program from the website. Uh, you can listen live or later there. You can also download from there lots of teachings on different subjects and different books of the Bible. Several hundred MP3 files are there. They're free. There's nothing for sale there. You can just go and download them and take them with you. There's also the article and many other articles. Uh, there's a there's a Bible forum that you can contribute to. That is, you can add your questions to. And also, there's the opportunity to contribute to the program if you want to. Uh, there's a PayPal link there. You can use your credit card or debit card if you want to make a contribution to help us pay for the radio time. If you'd like to write to us through our regular mail, you can write to The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 3633, Santa Cruz, California. 95063. You can find that address at our website also. Again, our website is www.thenarrowpath.com. Tomorrow night I'll be speaking in a home in Santa Cruz. You can find the contact information there at the website under the announcements link. Till tomorrow, this is Steve Gregg. Thanks for joining us.